In FIFA's world ranking, there are 210 countries, and among them, India's rank is 117. At first glance, this rank might not seem too disappointing. But let me give you three comparisons to put things in perspective. Syria, a country ravaged by civil war for years. North Korea, an isolated dictatorship where a majority of the population struggles with basic necessities. And Palestine, a territory that not all nations recognize as a country. Yet, all three of these countries rank higher than India in world football. Recently, India's football team was eliminated from the Asian Cup without scoring a single goal, losing all three of their matches. The Indian media called this campaign disastrous, but Indian football fans are sadly familiar with such disappointments. To see just how challenging the situation is for Indian football, you only need to watch footage from one of Delhi's premier regional league matches, which was overshadowed by match-fixing allegations. However, did you know there was a time when India was called the Brazil of Asia? During the 1950s and 60s, the Indian team was one of the best in Asia. They reached the semi-finals of the Olympics and won the gold medal twice at the Asian Games. But what happened? How did Indian football fall so far? To understand the current challenges in Indian football, we need to look at its history. India's relationship with football is not new. It goes back centuries. Football was introduced in our country during colonial rule through British army regiments and Christian missionaries. By the 18th century, several British teams began forming in India, including local clubs, colleges, and regiments. Calcutta became the heart of Indian football since it was the capital of British India. But one man changed it all, Nagendra Prasad Serbadhikari, who popularized football among the Indians in Calcutta. In 1911, Mohan Begin created history by becoming the first Indian team to win the IFA Shield. This was the first time a non-British team had won this prestigious tournament, sparking a national movement and making football a source of unity and pride. This victory not only challenged the British sense of superiority but also fostered Hindu-Muslim unity, with people from both communities celebrating together. It was a pivotal moment that marked the beginning of a golden era for Indian football. Years later, legendary coach Syed Abdul Rahim became the architect of Indian football's most successful phase. Under his guidance, the Indian team won gold at the Asian Games in 1951 and 1962, establishing itself as one of Asia's top teams. Rahim introduced new strategies, stressing teamwork, discipline, and tactics that suited Indian players. When the team returned home, they were greeted with a grand welcome. But shortly after, Syed Abdul Rahim was diagnosed with lung cancer, and a year later, he passed away. Many believe that with all the recent success, India was set to become a global powerhouse in football. However, that vision never materialized. The 1960s were the peak for Indian football, with the team winning over half of their matches. But by the 1980s and the 21st century, India struggled to win even a third of its matches. Forget winning gold, just participating in the Asian Games became an achievement as countries like South Korea, Japan, Iran, and Saudi Arabia surged ahead. What went wrong? The decline in Indian football's performance wasn't due to a single reason or individual. So I'll take you through events from the 1960s until now to give you a complete picture of India's football journey. One major issue within the football community was the lack of scientific awareness. Decades of evidence worldwide showed that playing barefoot didn't lead to optimal performance, but it took the Indians years to realize this. The barefoot style started on Calcutta's fields as a way to Indianize the British game. Despite available research showing the importance of shoes for better ball control and shooting, India's team continued to play barefoot, even in the 1948 Olympics. This trend persisted until a humiliating 10-1 loss to Yugoslavia in the freezing conditions of the 1952 Helsinki Olympics, where the Indian players, unprepared for the cold, played without shoes. The embarrassment of this defeat finally compelled AIFF to mandate shoes, highlighting a reactive rather than proactive approach to problem-solving. This same lack of foresight plagued the Indian domestic competitions, where matches were only 50 minutes long, despite the global standard of 90 minutes. This difference prevented players from developing the stamina needed for international play, which became evident during the 1956 Olympic semi-final against Yugoslavia. India matched them for 68 minutes, but in the final 22 minutes, the players' stamina dropped, leading to three goals conceded. 
AIFF was slow to adopt modern, scientifically-backed practices. Writer Soma Shankar Ray suggests that Indian authorities didn't see football as a professional field, merely a sport that should be treated as such. This attitude prevented them from realizing the broader benefits of excelling in a global sport. While Syed Abdul Rahim's leadership had brought success, the authorities failed to build on this, becoming overconfident instead. This lack of long-term vision was evident in the coach appointments. Following Abdul Rahim's tenure, Harry Wright was appointed as coach, but he couldn't grasp the Indian playing philosophy, leading to India's loss in the 1964 Asia Cup final, a tournament with only four teams. In the 40 years following Rahim, India went through as many coaches, with foreign coaches being hired in the 1980s based on the belief that European coaching would improve performance. Yet, as Rahim predicted in a 1952 interview, without strong local coaches, countries like Japan and South Korea would surpass India. Despite his warning, no training programs for Indian coaches were established, and AIFF continued relying on foreign hires. Take Iran as a comparison. Both India and Iran were under British influence and gained independence around the same time. But Iran prioritized coach development, and today, Iran has 139 pro-licensed coaches, compared to India's mere 14. These qualified coaches train young players professionally, while in India, many trainers lack essential qualifications. Problems in coaching emerged in the 1960s and expanded into the 1970s with club versus country conflicts. Players, coaches, and fans prioritized their club teams over the national team, especially in Calcutta, India's football hub, where the rivalries among Mohan Begin, East Bengal, and Mohammedan Sporting reached new heights after the 1947 partition. In 1981, ahead of the 1982 Asian Games in New Delhi, AIFF organized a camp for player training, asking players to skip club matches. But without club play, players wouldn't receive salaries, so they requested compensation from AIFF, which was denied, leading many players to boycott the camp. Eventually, a compromise was reached, offering players 2,000 rupees per month, yet the incident highlighted the tension over whether players should commit to clubs or the national team. This internal struggle hampered India's football progress while other Asian countries, like Japan and South Korea, made significant strides by investing in leagues, coaching, and infrastructure. Economics also played a role. India's GDP per capita was around $83 in the 1960s, compared to South Korea's $500. While South Korea's GDP rose to $32,000 over 60 years, India's grew to around $2,000. Wealthier countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Japan could afford substantial investments in football, but in India, government and private investments could have improved football but were redirected. In 1983, India celebrated Kapil Dev lifting the Cricket World Cup trophy, coinciding with the spread of television in the country. Color television was introduced in 1982, and Doordarshan's national broadcasts allowed the whole country to experience the moment. As cricket matches gained more television coverage, cricket's popularity surged. This shift continued in the 1990s when the liberalization of India's economy and the arrival of private channels led to commercial opportunities for cricket. The BCCI sold broadcasting rights, earning significantly higher revenues, while AIFF, without a similar fan base or broadcast interest, relied on limited funds from the government, AFC, and FIFA. For comparison, AIFF's total revenue in 2022 was 80 crore rupees, while BCCI's was 4,360 crore rupees. In this environment, AIFF struggled to support or market Indian football effectively. Without commercial interest or global exposure, the federation couldn't fund major initiatives, while cricket flourished, with Indian fans glued to televised matches featuring star players. Unfortunately, these commercial and broadcast shifts further pushed Indian football into the shadows, marking a prolonged period of stagnation that has lasted decades. India's football fans often blame cricket's rise for the decline in football, especially since the Indian cricket team's World Cup victory in 1983 coincided with the introduction of television. But a large part of the blame for football's mismanagement lies with the AIFF, All India Football Federation. Instead of capitalizing on football's potential, the AIFF's biggest mistake was failing to set up a proper national league. Now, what exactly is a national league? It's a structured system for organizing football. 
Take English football, for example. The English Premier League features the country's top 20 clubs competing in a season that spans 38 matches. At the end of each season, the bottom three teams are relegated to a lower league, and the top three teams from the lower leagues are promoted to higher leagues, creating a promotion and relegation system. This system keeps every team under pressure to perform. The Premier League season runs from August to May, meaning players play for almost 10 months continuously. Countries in Europe and South America implemented such league structures long ago, and several Asian nations, like Korea and Japan, introduced the K-League in 1983 and the J-League in 1992, respectively. It took AIFF years to realize this approach's importance. AIFF launched India's first national league, the National Football League, in 1996. Before that, there was no nationwide league for Indian clubs. Each state had regional leagues, but only about seven states had active leagues, including Bengal, Goa, and Kerala. This lack of exposure limited players' growth, as they only played within their state. National Cups were held, but a cup tournament, which has fewer matches, is vastly different from a full league. Practicing year-round in a league is essential for player development. The National Football League had just 12 teams, with no promotion or relegation system, meaning there was no pressure on players or teams to improve. With only 12 teams, it wasn't really a national league, so it didn't become popular across the country. The situation worsened in 2001 when ESPN began broadcasting the English Premier League in India. Indian fans, lacking a strong local league, began supporting English clubs instead. A survey showed that 38% of Manchester United fans were Indians. In 2007, AIFF tried to revamp the National Football League by rebranding it as the I-League and introducing a promotion and relegation system. However, the problems persisted. In 2010, AIFF signed a 15-year contract with IMG Reliance, hoping that private investment would solve Indian football's problems. But instead of improving the existing league, IMG Reliance launched the Indian Super League, ISL, modeled after the IPL. This led to conflict, as clubs like Mohun Bagan and East Bengal were concerned about their future. The two leagues continued operating separately until 2019, when it was decided that the ISL would be the top league, followed by the I-League, establishing a promotion and relegation system between the two. However, the ISL didn't solve all of Indian football's issues. It had the same issues as the I-League and NFL, with only 12 teams playing 22 matches each from March to September. Indian national coach Igor Stymak even stated that the league season should last 10 to 11 months to give players consistent practice and that there should be at least 18 teams with promotion and relegation to keep up the competitive pressure. Another major issue is that the ISL isn't financially sustainable. AIFF expected IMG Reliance's investment to make the league financially viable, but the clubs are incurring significant losses. A study showed that while ISL has collected around 777 Indian rupees crore in franchise fees, it has only generated 540 Indian rupees crore in broadcast revenue, resulting in a loss of 240 Indian rupees crore across all clubs. Only one club, Bengaluru FC, is profitable, while others, like FC Pune City, have shut down, and Delhi Dynamos FC had to relocate. One of the initial draws of ISL was that it attracted major international stars like Roberto Carlos and Nicolas Anelka, but they left soon after, and the quality of football didn't improve significantly. This impacted fan engagement, average attendance dropped from 26,000 in the first season to just 13,000 in the 2023-24 season. Indian football lacks youth development, which countries like Japan and Korea have prioritized by requiring each club to invest in youth teams. Former national player Guramanji Singh started playing football at 14, while Lionel Messi began at 5 and Cristiano Ronaldo at 9. This comparison highlights the gap in youth football in India. Successful football countries have youth leagues where players aged 15 to 18 play regularly, but AIFF hasn't developed such leagues. Even young Indian players are uncertain where to play, with little support from state associations or clubs. The problems in Indian football have led AIFF to announce grand plans, like hosting World Cup matches by 2034 and launching a Vision 2047 to make India a football power. Their vision includes having a three-tier national league with 40 teams, 14 teams each in ISL and I-League, and educating millions of children in football. However, 
Many experts view these plans skeptically. Some have suggested recruiting Indian origin players abroad, like Yin Danda, who plays in the Scottish Premier League. But to play for India, Yin would have to give up his British passport, making it impossible for him to play in European leagues. A more practical approach would be to allow players with OCI, Overseas Citizen of India, cards to represent India, as other countries like Qatar have done. But even this isn't a permanent solution. A sustainable solution would be focusing on three main areas without heavy spending. First, the Indian government must prioritize youth leagues by mandating that both ISL clubs and state associations develop youth teams. Second, AIFF should establish a strong league structure, as outlined in Vision 2047, with three tiers, numerous teams, and a 10-month season to build players' stamina and experience. Lastly, all teams should use social media to engage fans, from local tournaments to national leagues, creating content to build fan engagement. If these steps are executed effectively, perhaps one day India could regain its status as Asia's Brazil. So, can India ever reclaim its former glory and return to the top of Asian football? The path to success is clear. Investing in youth leagues, strengthening the national league, and engaging fans in the digital age. With the right steps, perhaps India can one day revive its football legacy and truly become Asia's Brazil once again. If you enjoyed this breakdown of India's football story, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more deep dives into football's greatest legacies. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.